everyone. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jackson Vungani, and here is what's coming up. The annual debate at the UN General Assembly has begun with world leaders taking their turns to raise issues that are serious for their countries, ranging from armed conflict to climate change. In the stunt assessment at the opening of today's proceedings, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres told world leaders the world is in danger. Our world is in peril and paralyzed. Geopolitical divides are undermining the work of the Security Council, undermining international law, undermining trust and people's faith in democratic institutions, undermining all forms of international cooperation. We cannot go on like this. The UN chief pointed to the war in Ukraine, multiplying conflicts around the world, the climate emergency, the dire financial situation of developing countries, and recent reversals of progress on such UN goals as ending extreme poverty and providing quality education for all children. But he said there is hope and shared an image of a ship carrying grain. But as we come together in a world teeming with turmoil, an image of promise and hope comes to my mind. This ship is the brave commander. It sailed the Black Sea with UN flag flying high and proud. On one hand, what you see is a vessel like any other plying the seas. But look closer. At its essence, this ship is a symbol of what we can accomplish when we act together. It is loaded with Ukrainian grain destined for the people of the Horn of Africa, millions of whom are on the edge of famine. Guterres urged world leaders to take action to protect food supplies, ensure the supply of fertilizers, and to work together on common problems, stressing that cooperation and dialogue are the only path forward. He warned that, quote, no power or group alone can call the shots. And now, VOA's UN correspondent Margaret Bishil joins me live to talk about how the proceedings are going. Hello, Margaret. Hi, Jackson. World leaders have started giving their speeches at the iconic podium. That's the first time in three years delivering their speeches in person, uh, starting with the UN chief himself, Antonio Guterres, that we, like we just heard, who gave a State of the World report. What was uh, his assessment of how things are looking from his point of view? Well, I think you pretty much covered it. Things are pretty bleak. He said the world is teeming with turmoil and uh, global discontent is on the horizon. So, But he did try and find some positives. He said there is hope, and uh, he called for action around it, and he said that the world needs to unite and be a coalition uh, as United Nations. Mm. You know? So he, he really tried to stress that uh, there are so many threats out there, there's no time to be fractured and uh, at, at each other's throats. You know, mm. we really need to come together, and you especially tell that, with climate change. You, know, you, you save some of the strongest language for climate change. Absolutely. And you could tell that there's a sense of urgency in his tone. But uh, Senegal's uh, president, uh, Maki Sal, who is also the head of the African Union, was the first African leader to address the assembly. What are some of the issues he addressed in his speech? Yeah, his speech was really uh, more a pan-African speech rather than a domestic speech because most leaders uh, talk about issues that are pertinent to their own country. But uh, Maki Sall is, as you mentioned, the AU president, and he spoke a lot about the AU. He said the AU should have a seat in, in the G20 so that Africa can be represented in a place where decisions affecting the 1.4 billion Africans are being made. Uh, he was... Uh, he drew a line under the youth in Africa. He said Africa is a solutions place, and we have a vibrant and creative youth in Africa. They innovate, they're entrepreneurs, they work hard. Um, so we need investment in them, and we need to create wealth and generate jobs for them. And he said Africa wants to engage with all of its partners in a reinvented relationship. So uh, he was definitely very pan-African in his speech. And he said Africa does not want to be the place of a new Cold War. Uh, they said He said Africa has suffered enough with the burden of history. And I think that is sort of an allusion to what's going on now uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. A lot of African leaders have said they're being 
pressed by both uh, Russia and the West to pick a side. Mm. And now, they don't really want to. Now, Margaret, before I let you go, uh, traditionally the U.S. president speaks second on the first day of the debate. Why didn't uh, President Biden speak during his uh, time slot? Well, uh, Queen Elizabeth's funeral on Monday sort of threw things into a bit of a mess in New York because so many world leaders went to her funeral, and so many of them are still making their way to New York. So a lot of speeches are, are shifting. But also uh, President Biden, who traditionally is the host country uh, leader, speaks second on the opening day, didn't speak today. And in fact, that's when Mackie Maki Sal spoke. Uh, he will speak on Wednesday in the morning at some point. And uh, we have two more African leaders we're going to hear from on Monday, uh, President of the DRC, Shishiketi, and the uh, head of state for Central African Republic, Tuadera. All right. That's VOA's UN correspondent, uh, Margaret Bashir, speaking to me live from the United Nations headquarters in New York. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, Jackson. A top U.S. diplomat say today the United States is aware of Eritrean troops crossing into Ethiopia's Tigray region. In an online news briefing, the U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Mike Hammer, said the Eritrean presence could inflame the fighting in Tigray. We've been tracking uh, Eritrean uh, troop movements uh, across the border. Uh, they are extremely concerning and we condemn it. Uh, all uh, e external foreign actors should respect uh, Ethiopia's territorial uh, integrity and avoid fueling the conflict. Uh, we couldn't be any clearer. We've said this repeatedly. Uh, we will encourage those that might uh, be able to communicate directly with Asmara that uh, this is uh, of extreme concern and, and must stop. Officials with the Tigray People's Liberation Force said today Eritrean forces began a new offensive in the TPLF's war with Ethiopian national troops. The fighting has gone on for nearly two years, displacing hundreds of thousands of people. Aid agencies say the Tigray region forces, faces a grave humanitarian disaster. Despite recent statements by both sides, they would agree to a ceasefire and hold talks. Fighting has surged in recent weeks. Hamas said he could not predict an outcome for efforts to bring the Ethiopian government and the Tigrayan leadership to the table. But what I can rest, you know, assure you is that uh, we are intensely working on, on this issue uh, with uh, not only the parties, but uh, in coordination with a number of our close uh, partners and allies, uh, both on the continent, in the region, uh, and extending uh, to Europe. And so I think you saw a lot of statements from other governments uh, urging the same. I think there's a chorus of calls for uh, peace talks to uh, to start, and we hope the parties will make the, the courageous decisions to to uh, to stop uh, the the fighting on the battlefield and uh, to sit across the table for for the good of all Ethiopians. Hamas say that the biggest obstacle to getting to peace talks is a lack of confidence. It's a matter of trust, trust, and trust. There's no confidence on either side that the other can be trusted. And that is why, whether it's you know, through the AU-led efforts, through efforts of the United States, through efforts of others, that we can hope to bring them together. They're basically, uh, two sides were once family. And disputes between families can be very rough. But you have to think of all the people who are suffering, who are victims of this conflict, and give a chance to build confidence in each other and sufficient trust that will lead to gradual steps on both sides to uh, ensure, again, uh, an end to the fighting. He said the United States, the African Union and other nations would work with all sides to build enough trust to get aid flowing to affected communities and start us down a road toward peace. The president of African Export Import Bank says Africa should move away from food aid and toward sustainable food production. 
Benedict Orama says a partnership between Africa and its international partners will help strengthen local agriculture. This, he says, will also encourage subsistence farmers to develop agriculture businesses that can improve their lives. His remarks come at a time at a meeting on the sidelines of the ongoing UN General Assembly in New York City. Organized by the Business Council for International Understanding, the meeting was aimed at empowering farmers. In an interview, Orama tells VOS Peter Clotty that cooperation between Africa and international partners can also help correct the imbalance of food surplus and food shortages between different parts of Africa. You see, the problem with food aid is that it creates dependence. I'm not saying that when we are in dire need that people can't come to help. But we should reject the way we do that so that in that process we build a foundation to make sure that we say never again. We don't have to rush to help again. So what is done today, uh, although it's beginning to change, is that when we, uh, we have famine, uh, we have extreme hunger, crisis, uh, donors rush food from all over the world, um, but they do not get it from Africa. So what that has then done is that people give the food they have, those who are donating give what they have, and over time our tastes have changed. What it then means is that we've developed the taste to eat the cheap food that has been donated, so we are no longer cultivating ours, what we normally eat. So it has created huge import dependence. So when we don't have money to pay for the import, we go hungry again. Not because we cannot produce, but because our tastes have changed and we are import dependent and we are not able to generate a foreign exchange to continue to import those things. So we have recurrent food. food. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Orama, what specific steps do you think African countries can take to reverse this or correct this? Uh, it, it doesn't have to be only African countries. It has to, that's why I, I, I gave you this background I right. gave earlier. It also has to go global, all the donor community and the African countries. Africa is a huge continent. As much of fact, as you talk about food uh, famine here, in other parts of Africa, there are surplus. The problem is that there is no moving. We are not moving those surplus from other parts of Africa to where you have scarcity, as will happen normally in a country. So what we are saying is, first, to stimulate overall food production on the continent, the donor community, if there is a food crisis uh, in one part of Africa, they should try to supply that part from other parts of Africa where you have surplus before you start going out if you don't have enough the second thing is that the demand created uh, by the, uh, the donor community and also ourselves should be enough to also stimulate production of food in many parts of africa what we've done and we we we, we and wf what food program have done something unique in this area in July, we entered in a manner of understanding ourselves, our Flexing Bank, the BFP, and African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. That MOU is in an amount of $2 billion. So we are doing, um, jointly with WFP, a blended financing uh, to enable us to provide funding to small growers in Africa and the commodity traders to make it possible for WFP to then buy from them to supply parts of Africa where we have food problem using FCFTA rules and protocols. That was Benedict Orama, president of African Export Import Bank. He was speaking with VOA's Peter Cloti. You're listening to African News Tonight. I'm Jackson Bungani in Washington. Somalia's military says that it has liberated a strategic central town from more than a decade of control by al-Shabaab terrorists. The win is the latest in an all-out military offensive against Islamist militants, as Mohammed Ahsayan reports from the Somali capital, Mogadishu. 
Somalia's National Army said Tuesday it recaptured the small but strategic town of Bo'o in the country's central Iran region from Al-Shabaab militants. The military said local militia backed them up in this latest offensive against the Islamist militants who, State TV says, have controlled the town for 13 years. Somalia National Television SNTV reported that Army Chief Brigadier General Odawa Yusuf visited the Hiran region village of Yasaman Tuesday, where the troops also drove out militants with local support. Hiran Governor Ali Jaita Osman spoke to VOA by phone. He said Bo'o was an Al Shabaab stronghold that was used as the region's base for their so called shadow court and to extort money from locals. Usman says in the last two days, the army took over the villages of Garasiani, Bo'o, Murfana, and a lot of other locations. He says he went to tell the Somali people that the Al-Shabaab fighters are cowards who can't compete with the army. The offensive came just a day after Somalia's government said the military forced Al-Shabaab out of 13 villages in clashes this month that killed more than 200 of the militants. Somalia's defense minister, Abdul Qadir Mohamed Noor, praised local militias who backed the military in the fights against Al-Shabaab. Somalia's information ministry in a statement Monday night acknowledged the army had received ice support from the U.S., during the offensives in Iran, Somalia has struggled to defeat the Al-Shabaab terrorist group for 15 years. Last month, the group attacked an international hotel in the capital Mogadishu, killing 20 people and wounding more than 100. Somalia's President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud responded to the deadly seed by announcing a total war against the militants. Mohamed Daisane for VOA News. Mogadishu, Somalia. And still in Somalia, the International Committee of the Red Cross is giving hundreds of thousands of households in Somalia monthly payments intended to provide emergency relief to people forced out of their homes by the severe drought. ICRC spokesperson in Africa in Nairobi, Aliona Sinenko, tells VOS Carol Van Dam that while the drought has lasted through four straight rainy seasons, South and Central Somalia are also affected by protracted armed conflict and rising food and fuel prices. We need to step up and respond. This, this crisis is, unfortunately, to use the term a perfect storm, it is, it's very relevant. It is, uh, and uh, it's it's been it's been coming. It's we've it's been forecast. You know, we we have seen it post COVID. We have seen the economic pressures come then. But what's what's really exacerbated this is obviously the, the Ukraine crisis and then the climatic shocks, uh, particularly in the Horn of Africa, where we've seen these uh, uh, recurrent uh, uh, failed rain seasons. We've had four so far failed rain seasons. That's, that results in. Uh, crop production, productivity falling, it, it results in, in uh, animal livestock death, it results in man, many, many, many impacts, but the outcome is, is hunger for some of the most vulnerable populations in the, in the countries affected. And, and that, what is the IFRC doing in sub-Saharan Africa and other r- really hard-hit areas of Africa to address the incredible hunger situation on, on the continent now? Well, the fantastic thing about the Red Cross and Red Crescent societies are that we we have a real groundswell of of people that we can tap into, our volunteers and our branch networks. So our basis, we're a volunteer-based organisation. They have access where many others don't. So we 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 get information, we get we find out where the marginalised groups are, we find out where the most vulnerable are, and we're able to support them. So as a as the international part of the organisation, then we're able to bring in resources and help address some of those acute needs at community level, at a very local level, which is which is our strength. Organizations like yours are warning about famine yes, yes. that could hit later this year in parts of Africa. Mm. Where is it and what do you do to counter famine? 
Well, famine, it's, it's, it's predicted in, in Somalia at the moment. That's what the humanitarian sectors are, and IPC values, as we call them, which are the bodies that give us the, the data to work from in terms of where we are in a, in a famine situation. And Somalia is the hot spot at the moment. But we've seen it in other countries as well, where we have local communities which are suffering really acute food insecurity. At the minute, we have uh, statistics tell us is 140, over 146 million people across sub-Saharan Africa who are in a state of crisis with regards to food security. That means they're hungry. That means they're tapping into their coping mechanisms, i.e. they're eating less every day, their children are eating less every day, they're cutting down on meals. They're maybe moving into starting to strip out assets to sell uh, uh, assets, sell uh, livestock, uh, machinery, whatever it is to bring in income. While they may not meet the, the statistical threshold, they're very acute needs at a local level across the country. And that's not just in Somalia. We've seen we've seen in Ethiopia, we've seen in Kenya, Nigeria, Niger, even as far as Angola, we're responding in Angola, our national societies. You know, they see these issues every day and, and they give us the reports and it's incumbent on us uh, as an international arm of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, to help our national societies to support these people. Two dozen mm-hmm. countries are facing the worst food crisis in decades, according to your organization. That's right. Most people who give may not realize how acute the problem really is. Are you getting the donations that you need to meet this crisis? No, unfortunately not. The funding hasn't hasn't materialized to the extent that we really needed to help support our national society, support the most vulnerable communities, to go that last mile and to find the people, to make sure kids can go to school, to make sure kids get, get the, the proper nutrition every day. That is Aliona Sinenko, Africa Regional Spokesperson for the ICRC, speaking with my colleague Carol Van Dam from Nairobi. The United States says it's banning poultry imports from Botswana due to an outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza on some poultry farms in the southern African country. From Habarone, Botswana, reporter Kodisi Dube has the details. Botswana exports poultry to the U.S., under a trade preference program, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, or ACOA. Under ACOA, products from eligible sub-Saharan African countries enjoy duty-free access to U.S. markets. But following the outbreak of the highly contagious HPAI, the U.S. Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services recently announced poultry imports from Botswana had been halted in a statement the agency says Botswana has been added to a list of countries that are prohibited from exporting poultry products and live birds to the U.S. A member of the Botswana Poultry Farmers Association, Adam Horeleng, says the decision will adversely affect their businesses. Our industry is only developing, and this is the last thing that you want to hear. We're still trying to establish ourselves and grow our exports to the U.S. market, and disease outbreaks do not help our situation at all. In 2020, Botswana exported $10,000 worth of poultry to the U.S., signaling an increase in recent years. Hurling is calling on the government to help plant the regular outbreaks of the avian influenza. This disease was detected at some poultry farms, meaning it does not spread to all corners of the country. Uh, there is a need for a robust strategy to reduce these outbreaks in order to protect the industry. The U.S. says the outbreak requires a rapid response as HPAI disease is often fatal to chickens, the reason for the decision to add Botswana to the list of banned countries. A researcher at the Botswana University of Agriculture and Natural Resources told the local media while the poultry industry is growing, the avian influenza is a constant drawback. Botswana's Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Trade, Gideon Mulawa, says the country is addressing the matter. For VOA, this is Mkondisi Dube in Habrone, Botswana. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Jackson Bungani in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voanews.com.